welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Stay tuned after this episode for a special preview of the audiobook of The Never Game by Jeffrey Deaver. Hi, everyone. This is Barney Leventino. And Jessica Chotan. And we are here today to turn the page, the official podcast of Syosset Library. And we have an extremely uh, special guest today. We are happy to welcome uh, Jeffrey Deaver, um, best-selling author. His latest book is The Never Game. Mr. Deaver, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Barney and Jessica. Good to talk to you. Thank you. I've been a fan for <laughs> quite a long time, and so this is doubly uh, exciting for it's, me. Uh, it's true, because when it when uh, the opportunity came up, Barney was like, yes! Yeah. So uh, I'd yeah, love this, not only do, do we have a new Jeffrey Deaver novel, <laughs> but we, we have a new protagonist in a new series featuring Coulter Shaw. And and you can't see it, but Barney is grinning from ear to ear, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is just yeah, really, very, really cool. <laughs> very happy. I, I, I'm sorry. I have to say I never get tired of hearing that. Believe me. That's that's why uh, why I uh, <laughs> that's why I said it. <laughs> so tell us about Coulter Shaw. Uh, I'll, I'll preface that by a, a story I heard once about Hollywood. Uh, that when a producer is looking for a, a new project to turn into a movie, he or she wants something that is completely original, never been seen before, and yet has been wildly successful and made a lot of money in the past. Well, we, we do laugh, and that's kind of a take on Hollywood, but there's some truth to that. And when I look for a, um, um, a, a new project, I look at what do my readers like? What has worked for them in the past? And that has been a typical deeper book, I'd call it, that fits this template. One, it takes place over a short period of time, only a couple days. <clears throat> it has a lot of internal reversals in it. So you come to the end of chapter three and learn that, oh my God, the person we thought was the detective is actually the killer. And then at the end of the book, there are two or three or four surprise endings. And then I also like to include what I call some uh, a hook, kind of an interesting topic, uh, maybe a contemporary topic, maybe not, but something that's uh, th that's just I think will be interesting to the readers. So that's the the old part, the part that's been successful in the past. But what's the wildly original part? Well, that I have to sit down and think about. And I decided, uh, based on something I, I happened to glance at a few years ago to create a new character who travels around the country looking for rewards. Now, we're all aware that rewards are offered, you know, for missing people and the police offer them for convicts and so forth. But I never paid much attention to it. So I looked into this a bit. I researched it. And it turns out the uh, the government, the Justice Department, uh, the United States, has millions of dollars of rewards they're offering for uh, criminals. There's a $25 million reward being offered uh, for a uh, information leading to the uh, arrest of a terrorist. $25 million. Well, that's quite, kind of interesting. So I created a character, who uh, Coulter Shaw, who travels around the country following these rewards. Now, he doesn't do it for the money. As it turns out, he doesn't really need or care about the money very much. But what he likes about the rewards is that they represent a challenge. Uh, if there's a reward, by definition, that means there's a problem that nobody else has been able to solve. And Coulter Shaw is a restless man. He's kind of like the old time gunslinger from those movies we remember from the 50s. And um, so he comes to town and tries to solve the crime, and then at the end of the day, jumps back in his Winnebago camper and heads off into the sunset. And I, I had great fun creating him, and uh, in the Never Game, it's an introduction, it's our first time we see him, he gets involved in quite some interesting cases. Absolutely. <coughs> Pardon me. I have to confess that um, as a reader, uh, when I pick up a book by an author who's... Um, series I've enjoyed, whose characters I've enjoyed, and I see that we're setting off on a new series, sometimes I go in with a little bit of um, fear that it's not going to hold up to uh, what came before. As an author, um, I'm guessing that for you there's probably a little bit of um, trepidation as you uh, launch a new character, launch a new series. 
Um, I have to tell you, let me go back and tell you, I read the book and I loved it, so my, my, my little fear in the back of my head was, uh, was not um, anything that became uh, an issue. The book was great. Uh, what was the inspiration for you for this particular series? Sure. And I, I will say, Barney, in response to your uh, your your great question just a second ago, um, I've been this is the uh, I've just celebrated my uh, 30th year being a full time novelist. I've written novels for 35 years and um, I am somebody who really keeps my finger on the pulse of what readers like and don't like. Uh, so when I came up with Coulter Shaw, I really wasn't too concerned. Now, we never know what the uh, critics are going to say, um, and we we never know what fans might say, but I was I was fairly comfortable that I'd be giving them what they um, what they wanted. You know, it's kind of like an airline pilot who is maybe she's she's flown uh, 767s a lot. Now she gets into a 777 and, uh, you know, there's really not a lot of concern or drama there. She knows where the switches are. She's done this before. So it's a slight variation, but there's really no, uh, no, uh, issue. So that's, I was pretty confident that, uh, people would like it. Now that's not to say that I, I will not listen to feedback and people may say they like this about Coulter. They like that about Coulter, this, they don't care for too much. I will certainly adjust my, uh, adjust my uh, future books and I'm writing the second Coulter Shaw right at the moment. But now I, I digressed a bit. Uh, uh, where, where did it, where did it, the never game come from? Well, <clears throat> it came out of a specific instant about um, three years ago. Now I've never been a video gamer. Uh, I'm f familiar with them, but uh, didn't know them too much, but I uh, was visiting my family and my nine year old niece uh, said, Uncle Jeff, can we play video games? And I said, well, I don't, honey, yeah, I'd be happy to. I just, you'll have to show me what to do. I don't quite know how they work. So uh, she showed me how to load it on my phone, and she had a, the game loaded on her phone. It was Minecraft, by the way, so you may be familiar with that. And I said, okay, and we went online so we could play together. So we were both, our avatars were both in the game together. And I said, well, now what do we do? And she said, it's very simple. You die. And she pulled out a sword and <laughs> Stabbed me to death <laughs> like the first 10 seconds. I, I was, oh I have to say, I thought it was not quite sporting of her, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and you know, we, we laughed about it. And, uh, so, and then she showed me how to play and we had a lot of fun, but playing the game, I found, I got very tense. Uh, because it's it, it's it was in the uh, if your listeners are familiar with it it's called the survival mode of Minecraft. There's a, a creative mode where you build things, and then there's survival mode where you can kill things and track down bad guys. And they yeah, we you. we have a lot of uh, people who talk about that, and they're just like, oh no, uh, though they they never they never go into survival mode, you know, when they yeah. talk about their kids. And I'm like, no, I'm sure they they never do. Yeah, really. <laughs> but well, I'm sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's. Well, uh, they only build. They only make baskets and pet the little sheep on their heads. I'm sure that's uh, what they're up to. Well, but I thought, um, you know, it's I it, it, it kind of it, it's a very small uh, and relatively simple game. Unlike some of these massive, well, they're actually they're called massively massive multiplayer online role playing games, more pegs that are played by hundreds of thousands of people around the world at once. Very complicated games, um, but nonetheless, I was very. Uh, I was kind of edgy playing it. it I, I stepped into a different world and I thought, ah, this is what I want to do for one of my books. And so the Never Game has this premise. A um, person or persons have kidnapped someone. We open with the kidnapping of a, a young woman in Silicon Valley. And it appears that the kidnapper has been inspired and is reenacting a video game in the real world so that... Um, in the, the video game, the uh, the character is uh, finds uh, on the screen, wakes up and finds him or herself with uh, in an abandoned area with five objects they have to use to escape, sort of MacGyver like. And in the, the in my book, the Never Game, the victim wakes up and she has five objects and she has to try to use those to escape before the villain comes back to. Uh, uh, to dispatch her, or she has to make weapons with those five objects. Well, Coulter Shaw, my hero, comes to Silicon Valley. The police don't believe this can happen because it's a bit far-fetched, but he 
does believe it can happen because of some things her father says. And he gets involved in the, the video gaming world uh, and with the assistance of a, a woman named Maddie Poole, who's a professional game player, video game player, uh, they try to track down this woman and other victims. And the book is, again, that fits the Deaver mold, moves very quickly, takes place over a couple days and has uh, a couple, well, has three really big surprise endings. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> on the um, subject of video gaming, the book touches on um, some issues which have come up in the past in terms of uh, uh, video game addiction, in terms of copycat uh, crimes, as you describe here. Um, you don't get preachy, which is nice, but you're leaving the reader with something to think about in terms of where these games might be leading some people. Thank you for observing that. When I teach my courses in writing, I tell my students what Ernest Hemingway said, if you want to send a message, go to Western Union. And I have to say, I look out over my uh, class, and this is not in, in school. These are like uh, private classes, although I have taught in school. But I get students all the way from like 15 up to the 70s or 80s. And the younger people, when I say Western Union, just stare blankly. Like, what's Western Union? And so I, I should say, that, well, then I tell them, if, if Ernest Hemingway were saying that now, he'd say, if you want to send a message, put it on Facebook or send a tweet. Although I have to say the idea of Ernest Hemingway sitting down in Key West under a palm tree with his smartphone <laughs> is very, very jarring. But uh, my, my, my point to them and his point was, your books need substance. Clearly, he wrote about geopolitical issues, the Spanish-American War, fascists, uh, communists, um, uh, democracy, courage, but he didn't preach about it. And that's exactly what I try to do. I try to inform my books. I try to give them a, uh, a certain emotional depth by writing about issues. And um, some of the issues in the Never Game are um, the risks of video games. I did a lot of research and I have concluded as most uh, scientists have, or most uh, psychologists and people involved in um, the, um, uh, I guess I'd say the criminality of uh, the internet, that th th there's probably no causation. So take an otherwise well-adjusted younger person, a uh, young man or young woman, and they are not going to play a video game and say, you know, I never thought about it, but I'm going out and getting a machete and going to attack people. But what we do find is that people who are otherwise disposed to violence are drawn to violent video games. And some of the video games are extremely troubling. There's a game called um, uh, Grand Theft Auto, and there are certainly skills involved uh, in, in that game, uh, both physical skills and mental skills, uh, manipulating the cars you drive and weapons and things like that. But there are also you can earn points simply by murdering people. That murdering that game, if you if yeah. you don't mind me interjecting really quickly, um, I forget which version of it came out. Um, it was like the early two thousands, and a bunch of my friends were playing it. And I and they not only that, but it, it had a soundtrack, and the soundtrack wasn't bad. Um, no, exactly. And I'm not. I'm like I'm probably remarkably bad at video games because I have empathy for things for like people that don't exist. So right. I like, you know, Tetris and Mario Brothers I can do, but <laughs> anything like that, you know, and my, my husband is a big gamer and I'm just like, okay, whatever, you know, like he'll play more like the fantasy based ones, but anything like Grand Theft Auto, I have just too much empathy for these people that don't exist. But anyway, I digress. My point is one of the crazy things about being friends and getting in the car with somebody who is playing Grand Theft Auto and listening to the soundtrack as they're playing Grand Theft Auto, then getting into their car and putting the soundtrack on, they became crazy drivers. Like, I, I wouldn't drive with them. I'm like, guys, I you know. I absolutely, absolutely believe that uh, because I found the video game world incredibly submersive. Um, I uh, just playing that little game with my niece. I, of course, in writing the Never Game, did log on and play uh, like World of Warcraft. I had um, uh, Doom. I bought Doom to play. Doom uh, is a first-person shooter game. Doom was Doom was to... really big. I think it was one yeah. of um, the most downloaded uh, files of like 1995 or something like that. That one I think was one of the first ones to kind of raise people's brows about a first-person shooting game. 
It was really one of the the first popular uh, first person shooting games. Interesting thing uh, fact about Doom is that w it was originally given away, that the uh, designers had no desire to make money. This was something that the uh, uh, computer geeks, and I consider myself a geek and a nerd, so I can say that, that they did because it, it was uh, intellectually challenging, it was part of a community, they created this game along with many other games, and just gave it away, and then ka-ching, somebody realized, oh, maybe we can make a little money at this, and now the video gaming world, um, revenues are uh, greater than Hollywood makes more money than uh, all the movies uh, produced every year in, in Hollywood. Uh, 200, over 200 million Americans play regularly. Uh, in China, 700 million uh, citizens play uh, video games there. And it is a, a, a massive, uh, massive world. I, 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 the one thing that did concern me about the video games, um, in addition to the, the questions about violence, which I, I think are probably a little... Uh, less troubling than some people think. However, the addictive quality, and as with any activity or substance or food or, or drink, uh, in moderation, fine. But once it crosses a borderline and interferes with a um, you know a healthy, uh, normal lifestyle, it can be a problem. And there are people who uh, become so obsessed with these games they play for. Uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, uh, people have lost their jobs because they play, or they've downsized in their job and are not working uh, to their uh, potential. In China, this was uh, true when I was researching the book about a year ago, uh, China was uh, introducing a law that limited the amount of time someone could play video games. And of course, uh, the Chinese uh, security apparatus is uh, more, uh, uh, I'd say, in invasive than ours. And they, they would know when people were, in fact, uh, playing video games. And uh, so they were going to limit it to X number of hours uh, a week. Then you watch a video game. What are you going to do? Uh, you know, go upstairs and make a very uh, uh, sophisticated, healthy salad to eat? No, you're going to wave nachos and drink that big Slurpee. And there's, you know, uh, onset diabetes is a problem. Uh, weight gain is a problem with uh, gamers. And, um, you know, health issues uh, as well. A little bit of exercise goes a long way. Uh, a lot of people just sit in front of the computer screen and play. Yeah, it's. Um, I see it in my nephews as well. They just, they get focused and you can barely just get their attention drawn away uh, for even a brief moment. Um, another aspect of Coulter Shaw's personality uh, I think derives from his upbringing, his uh, being raised in a survivalist family and I found that also an interesting aspect of the of the book and I'm curious as to what type of research went into that part of your uh, your work. Sure, I, uh, I'm a plot driven author <clears throat> I, I have my, uh, you know, these roller coasters that I ride. A plot comes first for me, but uh, it's vital that a, a character you create for your fiction resonates, is a real living, breathing human person. Um, that's true for the good guys and the bad guys. We want our villains to be fully fleshed out, too. And part of that is creating a, um, a backstory for them that, that informs who they are. Now, uh, Coulter Shaw's father, a man named Ashton Shaw, was a, a, a brilliant professor at a university in the um, San Francisco Bay Area. I don't say Berkeley itself, uh, but it could, University of California, Berkeley. I don't mention that, but it could very easily be that school. <clears throat> and uh, in his, in his uh, research, he discovered something. Now, we don't know what it is in this book. Uh, that will be revealed in future books, but whatever he discovered, uh, some individuals did not want to let that information out into the public. And so Ashton Shaw discovered he was at risk. So he fled the Bay Area with his family and moved to a compound in eastern um, California <clears throat> in the Sierra Nevada, Mountain, Sierra, uh, Sierra Nevada Mountains. And um, he uh, taught, learned and taught his children survival skills. Now, there's a whole panoply of survivalists. There are the wackos, uh, the uh, you know religious fanatics, uh, the ones who believe that aliens are coming down from the planet Xantar or whatever, and it will be uh, the apocalypse, the ultra-religious uh, survivalists, the uh, neo-Nazi survivalists. That was not, um, that was not um, Coulter Shaw's father. There are survivalists who simply believe in, in self-reliance, um, a la... Um, 
uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote the essay Self-Reliance, for instance, that you should um, uh, learn to live on yourself. You should be skeptical of uh, institutions. Doesn't mean you distrust them. Doesn't mean you have to overthrow the government. It just means that you know, maybe the government doesn't always look out for you the best they should, which is certainly, certainly true. And so, but part of that is teaching your children, uh, Ashton Shaw was thinking, to survive. If the bad guys come after you, if the system breaks down, which it certainly could, um, I want you to be able to survive in the, uh, the wilderness, in the city, to learn how to hunt, to learn how to preserve food, to learn how to make shelter. And uh, he taught his children those skills. They had graduation. What was the graduation from the school? Climbing a rock face 100 feet in the air on a stormy night. Now they were roped in, Nobody, the children were not in any uh, physical risk, but they had to do that in order to graduate from the uh, quote survival course. And Colter Shaw brings those skills into um, his uh, looking for rewards. Now, I know uh, one of you is going to ask me, so Jeff, what do you know personally about survivalism? Here is my uh, survival uh, technique. You I'm on my- didn't drop you off in the wilderness with a Swiss army knife and a book of matches? <laughs> well, the, the, probably the, the, the most arduous survival experience I've, I've ever had was in the last week when I was on my back porch, my dog's at my feet, and I looked at my glass of wine and it was empty. So I had to get up, walk over the dogs because they were sleeping, <laughs> go in, get a new glass of wine and, and, and come back. That's crazy. Uh, but I did, actually, I, you know what? I did use, it wasn't a Swiss army knife, but it was one of those corkscrew uh, <laughs> wine openers that I had to, you know, I actually, actually had to use some muscle power to exert. Well, I'm joking a little bit. I, I used to hike, I used to fish a bit. So I have some knowledge of the outdoors, but most of that was, uh, was research. Um, as I was reading the book, I and again, I, I, I've been reading your books for a while, and I, it struck me some significant differences between Coulter Shaw and Lincoln Rhyme. And I'm not talking about physical differences. I'm talking about um, their whole approach and their priorities. Um, when I think Lincoln Rhyme, I think scientist. And his... Uh, the end all and be all for him is is the evidence. Chain of custody is sacrosanct, and it's almost like the people are way back in the distance. Whereas Coulter Shaw is the opposite way. He seems to be um, putting the people who are involved or who are the victims of these crimes first and foremost, and that seems to um, be a big aspect of his approach and uh, his character in terms of what he's trying to accomplish in these um, in his adventures. That's exactly right. You hit the nail on the head, Barney. Uh, one of the reasons I created Coulter was that he's uh, the basically the opposite in many ways of Lincoln Rhyme. Um, and I'm not speaking of Lincoln's disability now. I'm speaking, as you point out, of his uh, fascination, indeed, I'll say obsession with the scientific, with the evidence. Uh, sometimes I think Lincoln doesn't even remember that there is a, a victim or a villain involved. It's simply Lincoln against the evidence. Um, and that's that's reality in, in, in a certain way because uh, crime solving now requires forensic science. There's just no question about it. We hear about these fascinating cases uh, being solved years after a horrific crime because a relative, a distant, distant relative of a criminal has gone on 23andMe and gotten a uh, done a DNA test, and somehow that DNA ends up back at the detective's uh, desk who was uh, trying to solve a case 30 years ago, and they can now track down that villain. So we certainly uh, love and respect forensic science. However, it has its limits, uh, and, I'm, and I'm talking about writing crime fiction now. We also love the people investigator, the one who doesn't really care or doesn't have access to the scientific equipment because he's not a cop. So what Coulter Shaw does, he he leaps into the real world of people and human beings and uh, gets to know them, talks to them, analyzes them, sizes them up. Uh, he's very savvy. He's very sharp. He's very persistent. And uh, he's the kind of, uh, kind of fellow who uh, here's, uh, doesn't study body language per se, but he says, you know, this, this doesn't smell right. I'm going to, I'm going to pursue this. And, um, uh, he also isn't somebody 
who's really quick on the draw. He, there's a scene in the, the the Never Game where he's confronted by a fellow who uh, uh, is. It looks like he's going to attack him, and it's it's kind of a tense scene. And the way I write it, I say, well, Colter Shaw uh, reached for his uh, his uh, favorite weapon, the one that he he used all the time. And what does he pull out? Not his Glock, not his Smith and Wesson. He pulls out an iPhone. And what does he do? He calls 911. And um, uh, you, you know, he's now he's ready to go to the mats with somebody. He was a wrestler in college. That was his sport. But he doesn't really need to do that. He, he kind of outthinks the villains. And um, that's why I, I found him a, a unique character, one that's very appealing, and uh, frankly, one I'd like to sit down and have a beer with. Yeah, he is definitely an interesting guy, definitely somebody you'd like to meet and spend some time with. Um, the supporting characters in the book are also quite interesting. Um, you have... Uh, Teddy and Velma Bruin back in Florida minding the uh, homestead for uh, Coulter while he's out there. Um, he hooks up also with um, some of the local police force, uh, LaDonna Standish in particular, the detective that um, he, uh, he works pretty closely with. Um, how do you develop your supporting characters? And, and I'd love to learn more about Teddy and Velma and how they got involved in, uh, in Shaw and his, his profession. Sure. It's um, very important to have supporting characters especially in a series uh, book, as, as the Shaw books are. The Never Game is the first in the series. I'm working on the second one right now. So why are supporting characters so familiar? Well, the answer to that is Star Trek. And by that, I mean this. Do you remember the scene in Star Trek when the uh, Enterprise is circling the planet where the bad guys are? And who beams down to the surface? Well, uh, of course, Kirk and Spock and Scotty and Bones. And then there's the fifth crewman, the the handsome young actor who was not on last week's show and will not be on next week's show because he's the expendable one. Well, that's what my supporting characters do. I, I'm on record as saying I'm never going to kill Coulter Shaw. I'm never going to kill Lincoln Rhyme. I may mess him up a little bit mentally, physically, but I'm never going to kill him. Uh, but I'm going to introduce living, breathing characters like Velma and Teddy and uh, LaDonna and like Maddie Poole and throw them in the pressure cooker and they may or may not survive the end uh, the, of the book. The, um, the, yeah. the Star Trek term for that, was that red shirt? The red shirt. The yeah, red the shirts. Book. Yeah, I can imagine the actor showing up for casting call and he's so excited he's <laughs> going to be on Star Trek and he opens it up and he says, you know, they don't even give him a name. He said, the red shirt. And that was it. He said, that's it. I'm on for one day. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think in recent times they, they've changed that. But that must have been to, to the dismay of many an aspiring actor. Right. OK, so, Mr. Deaver, without giving away any spoilers uh, about uh, how the Never Game ends, Shaw has some interesting choices to make right there at the end. And uh, we're looking forward to what can we expect? Where uh, next? Yes, in, in those, uh, as I said, Shaw survives the end of the book. There's no question about that. He has a bit of a loss. We know that. I'm not going to explain what that's about, but he has a bit of a loss. But he um, is um, uh, is confronted with a uh, an interesting choice. And I'll, I'll say this because it's not giving too much away. Uh, there's a uh, apparently a troubled young man who has committed a horrific crime, it seems. We're not sure, but it seems like he has. And um, there has been, this is in Washington state, and uh, two rewards have been offered for this young man who has escaped from, uh, from the police. And one reward is for $50,000. And that's offered by the town and the police and some rich folks in the city because uh, this crime uh, was so horrific. And then there's another reward offered for the same young man to find him um, for $900. And that's by the family, his family, that scraped together this money. It's all the money they could, they could find. Now, the $50,000 is to find... The, the kid who they think is guilty and their attitude is he did it. They don't have evidence, but they just are sure he did it. Uh, they want him dead or alive. The family says he didn't do it. We know he didn't. We know in our heart he didn't. And so Coulter Shaw is given the choice of pursuing one reward or the other. And he still has to find the, the young man, of course. But of course, we since we know Coulter Shaw for the hero he is, he's going to talk to the family and see if he can uh, pursue this young man. Um, that is the uh, a an aspect of the uh, 
the next book, the one I'm working on right now, and then it takes a 180 degree turn, about which I can say no more. Well, we will look forward to that, certainly. Uh, this is will, this has been great. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today, taking the time out. Again, I love the book. I will encourage all of our readers here at the library and our listeners to our podcast to uh, pick up The Never Game by Jeffrey Deaver. Thank you so much, Mr. Deaver. Thank, thank you. you. A pleasure talking to you. Take care now. <laughs> you as well. And we're going to turn the page. And now a sneak preview of the audiobook of The Never Game. Audio excerpted courtesy Penguin Random House. Audio from The Never Game by Jeffrey Deaver, narrated by Kaleo Griffith. He asked the woman to repeat herself. That thing they throw, she said, with the burning rag in it, they throw. Like at riots, a bottle, you see them on TV, Coulter Shaw said, a Molotov cocktail. Yeah, yeah, Carol was saying. I think he had one. Was it burning, the rag part? No, but, you know, Carol's voice was raspy, though she wasn't presently a smoker that Shaw had seen or smelled. She was draped with a green dress of limp cloth. Her natural expression seemed to be one of concern, yet this morning it was more troubled than usual. He was over there, she pointed. The Oak View RV Park, one of the scruffier that Shaw had stayed at, was ringed with trees, mostly scrub oak and pine some dead, all dry, and thick, hard to see, over there. You call the police? A pause. No, if it wasn't a, what again? Molotov cocktail. If he didn't have one, it'd be embarrassing, and I call the cops enough for stuff here. Shaw knew dozens of RV park owners around the country, mostly couples, as it's a good gig for middle-aged marrieds. If there's just a single manager, like Carol, it was usually a she, and she was usually a widow. They tend to dial 911 for camp disputes more than their late husbands, men who often went about armed. On the other hand, she continued, fire, here, you know. California was a tinderbox, as anybody who watched the news knew. You think of state parks and suburbs and agricultural fields, Cities, though, weren't immune to nature's conflagrations. Shaw believed that one of the worst brush fires in the history of the state had been in Oakland, very near where they were now standing. Sometimes I kick somebody out, they say they'll come back and get even. She added with astonishment, even when I caught them stealing forty amps when they paid for twenty. Some people, really, he asked, and you want me to... I don't know, Mr. Shaw, just take a look. Could you take a look, please? Shaw squinted through the flora and saw, maybe, motion that wasn't from the breeze. A person walking slowly? And if so, did the pace mean that he was moving tactically? That is, with some mischief in mind. Carol's eyes were on Shaw, regarding him in a particular way. This happened with some frequency. He was a civilian, never said he was anything else, but he had cop fiber. Shaw circled to the front of the park and walked on the cracked and uneven sidewalk, then on the grassy shoulder of the unbusy road in this unbusy corner of the city. Yes, there was a man, in dark jacket, blue jeans, and black stocking cap, some twenty yards ahead. He wore boots that could be helpful on a hike through brush and equally helpful to stomp an opponent. And yes, either he was armed with a gas bomb or he was holding a corona and a napkin in the same hand. Early for a beer some places, not in this part of Oakland. Shaw slipped off the shoulder into the foliage to his right and walked more quickly, though with care to stay silent. The needles that had pitched from branch to ground in droves over the past several seasons made stealth easy. Whoever this might be, vengeful lodger or not, he was well past Carol's cabin. So she wasn't at personal risk. But Shaw wasn't giving the guy a pass just yet. This felt wrong. Now the fellow was approaching the part of the RV camp where Shaw's Winnebago was parked, among many other RVs. Shaw had more than a passing interest in Molotov cocktails. Several years ago, 
He'd been searching for a fugitive on the lam for an oil scam in Oklahoma when somebody pitched a gas bomb through the windshield of his camper. The craft burned to the rims in twenty minutes, personal effects saved in the nick. Shaw still carried a distinct and unpleasant scent memory of the air surrounding the metal carcass. The percentage likelihood that Shaw would be attacked by two Russian-inspired weapons in one lifetime, let alone within several years, had to be pretty small. Shaw put it at 5%, a figure made smaller yet by the fact that he had come to the Oakland-Berkeley area on personal business, not to ruin a fugitive's life. And while Shaw had committed a transgression yesterday, the remedy for that offense would have been a verbal lashing, a confrontation with a beefy security guard, or at worst, the police, not a firebomb. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.